This is an event hall in Seoul. Can you see me? The event that Diplomat Talks was invited to is a very warm welcome to you all as we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Innovation Center of Denmark in Korea. Yes, this is an event to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Innovation Center Denmark in Korea, or ICDK in Korea. Wait a minute. You didn't tell us what the Innovation Center is. Ah, Innovation Center is what the Innovation Center is. I'm going to tell you now. Innovation Center Denmark, or ICDK, is a cooperative organization between the Danish Ministry of Higher Education and Science and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It provides customized consultation and support to Danish companies, researchers, and research institutions seeking innovation and wanting to conduct research and business. ICDK is located in seven innovation regions chosen for their relevance for Danish companies, researchers, and higher education institutes, and Korea is one of them. The goal of ICDK is to bring about technological exchanges and cooperation that make use of each country's strengths. So in every region, the center plays a key role in conducting R&D based on knowledge related to each country. This is the executive director of ICDK Seoul. Shall we listen to what the goal of ICDK is? Our mission across the seven innovation centers is really to elevate Danish science and innovation through collaboration with world-leading innovation ecosystems. At the event, people celebrated the 10th anniversary of ICDK Seoul. Additionally, experts from both countries shared perspectives on future science and technology and emphasized the need for cooperation in science, technology, and innovation. As I listened to the stories from the event, I became curious about ICDK Seoul's specific projects. Also, I wondered what kind of cooperation the two countries will carry out through the center in the future. So in celebration of the 10th anniversary of ICDK Seoul, we decided to conduct in-depth interviews with the two people who knew the most about the center. These are today's interviews for Diplomat Talks. Shall we begin the interview now? So, an event marking the 10th anniversary of the Innovation Center was held in December last year. So, how does it feel to have the Center celebrate 10 years in Seoul? Ambassador? Well, we're a little bit proud. We're very happy. There's something to celebrate. It's been 10 years mm -hmm. uh, since we took the decision to open Innovation Center in Seoul. One of only seven uh, in the world, so it was a hard choice for us. Uh, a lot of discussion back then. Where do we do this? Uh, but I'm very happy, we're very happy uh, today that it was the right decision mm. to open an innovation center in mm. Seoul. Mm. So director, for our viewers, can you tell us about the innovation center and what it does? So the innovation center has one mission mm. and that is to foster collaboration between the, the Korean innovation ecosystem and the Danish. It starts with saying who are the innovators. It's about getting universities involved. It's about getting the companies involved. It's about getting the startups. It's about also having innovation as that foundation uh, under growth and also supporting the, the trade relations between our countries. So if we look at what are the elements, we have a strategic collaboration between the Ministry of Science and Education in Denmark and the Ministry of ICT and Science in Korea. Mm -hmm. And this is just very important to sort of set the direction and agree where do we want to go with this. And we, we have agreed to work on green transition, mm -hmm. uh, digitization and health and life science. Mm -hmm. So basically areas that both Korea and Denmark are interested in and where we have complementary industry strengths and, and research strengths. So that's, that's the foundation of the innovation centers.
so Ambassador, as you mentioned, that Korea is one of the few countries that has like Danish Innovation Center. Mm -hmm. So why was Korea chosen? The primary reason is that uh, Korea and Denmark are known well worldwide to be innovation leaders. Korea and Denmark are countries that offer solutions for the future. We offer solutions for the big global problems facing mankind. Listening to the ambassador's story made me curious. Are the two countries really known internationally as innovative countries? Out of curiosity, I decided to do some research. While searching for the definition of innovative countries, I discovered something called the Global Innovation Index. It is data released annually by the World Intellectual Property Organization. The Global Innovation Index ranks the innovation performance of 132 countries, highlighting their strengths and weaknesses. The index consists of about 80 indicators, including measures of the political environment, education, infrastructure, and knowledge creation. In the 2023 GII, Denmark ranked 9th and Korea ranked 10th out of 132 countries. Looking more closely at the indicators, we found that Denmark ranked highly in the following categories infrastructure, institutions, and human capital and research. Meanwhile, Korea ranked highest in human capital and research, creative performance, and business advancement. Then, besides the fact that both countries are known globally as innovative countries, I wondered if there was another specific reason for establishing ICDK Seoul. When we look at Seoul, uh, one of the characteristics here and what has been a fascination of uh, an area like the smart city. We don't have mega cities uh, in Denmark or the Nordics. Mm. So this is something very particular that we can offer. Mm. How do you actually have such an efficient transportation, uh, such a safe city and metropolitan area of, of 24 million people. It's, it's like f four or five times Denmark's population. So this is like a recurrent value proposition, location-based value proposition of Seoul. So we work with a little bit of different themes depending on the location. A smart city is defined differently by each country. But in Korea, a smart city is defined as a sustainable city that provides a variety of urban services based on urban infrastructure built by converging construction, ICT, and other factors to improve the city's competitiveness and quality of life. Korea's strengths in smart city development can be divided into two categories. First, Korea has world-class ICT technology and is home to some of the world's best companies in related fields, such as Samsung and LG. Korea is also an IT-friendly country with the highest smartphone penetration rate and internet usage in the world. Also, Korea has diverse experience in urban development Korea overcame the devastation of the Korean War in the 1950s and achieved rapid economic growth after the 1960s. In addition, Korea has accumulated a range of urban development know-how through trial and error in its new city development process for over 20 years. Do you think we are complementary partners? Very much so. Uh, one thing that Korea has, uh, Korea has all the innovation, all the researchers, is known as an innovation country. But one thing you have that we don't have is a very strong industrial base. So there's also, you help us, we help each other. Take an area like offshore wind. Mm. We are very strong in that. We have long tradition. We were the first in the world to go deep in that. We have very strong companies in that. Denmark is considered the world's leading offshore wind power country. It has favorable conditions for offshore wind power, including abundant wind resources, a long coastline, and shallow water. It developed the world's first offshore wind power complex in 1991. 
as of 2022, wind power has become Denmark's core renewable energy source, reaching 54% of the total electricity generation mix. But here's what's happening. So the, the Danish companies are investing in Korea in offshore wind, and the Korean companies are investing in Danish offshore wind companies. Uh, so it complements each other. And then we go together in third markets, so that when we are having projects in Taiwan, mm. in Japan, in Vietnam, mm. in the Philippines, we combine the Danish know-how and specifically the mm. offshore wind industry with the strong industrial arm mm. of Korea. Mm. Then we are really competitive together. So it's a it's a win-win. Oh, okay. So we make synergies like that. Yes. Mm, very interesting. Mm. My good friend, the uh, uh, the Korean ambassador to Copenhagen, Ambassador Kim. He put it this way. He said, uh, in Denmark, you're first movers on many of these technologies on the future, but in Korea, we are fast movers. If we work together, bali bali, you know, <laughs> we can really uh, make a difference. Mm. And I think he's right. Mm. So are there any Danish companies have entered Korea through this innovation center? Yes, mm. and I think you, uh, but not only companies, mm. uh, because it goes wide. That's the whole idea of the innovation mm. center. It goes beyond just the, the export promotion, investment promotion, uh, the immediate uh, commercial case. It's more like a long-term case, something where you need to work for a while before maybe later there'll be a strong commercial uh, base. So it's small companies, it's startups, it's universities, it's researchers, it's the large enterprises, it's the small companies. It's the whole palette, but long-term. Long saying what can we build long term together in terms of uh, innovation. But there are really good examples of um, what it has, uh, has led to, both at a government to government level and at a large enterprise level and at a startup level. For me, when I heard the word innovation, the first thing that came to mind was a company. But through the ambassador's words, I realized once again that various entities can be innovative. Cities can also be uh, innovators, and we've seen that with, uh, for instance, the mayor of Seoul mm. traveling to, uh, to Copenhagen to pick up some of the solutions that might be relevant in Seoul. Uh, I think in such a gigantic metropolis as uh, Seoul, I think the fourth largest metropolis on the planet, it's about scaling things. And, and you can look at our capital, Copenhagen, as a little bit of a lab, saying uh, they're front runners trying to try different things mm -hmm. in their city, but it's also a smaller city, uh, so it's more doable. But then we're honored when the mayor of Seoul comes to study these things and say what will work in Seoul at a completely, massively different uh, scale. We could also add to that, coming the other way, um, the city of Odense, uh, who is really interested in, it's a, it's a great robotic city, mm -hmm but uh, has been collaborating actually for also 10 years with the Seoul Metropolitan Government. The city of Odense has uh, mm. the National Robotics Cluster uh, and it has uh, the, the university in Odense is actually uh, very renowned for its robotics mm. uh, education. So when we talk about innovation ecosystems, there's a clear connection between the cities, mm. the companies, mm. the universities, mm. the startup environments. You could say sort of their interests align, but they have different toolboxes, they have different roles in making that innovation happen. And as a city, you can make the good framework conditions mm. uh, for the innovators. Mm. So, Director, could you tell us a few projects that you're now working on? Yes. Mm. For the first time, we're kicking off three uh, two-year projects between uh, Danish and Korean research communities mm. and innovation communities. One is within uh, Hydrogen and Power 2X, uh, one is within Smart Cities, and one is within uh, Robotics uh, and AI. So we facilitate that there will be Korean delegations going to Denmark, uh, Danish delegations coming to Korea, but also that the purpose of this collaboration is actually building more, using this project to finding out how can we actually do uh, more serious joint research proposals. Mm. So, so I, I would say those are main projects, but then another thing that is quite important is a uh, so whole focus on, on strategic and critical technologies now. An area like quantum uh, is, uh, is very important.
Korea is a selected country in the, in the Danish quantum st strategy, so like a preferred country of collaboration. So that brings a, a very big task for us uh, to try and, and uh, get these communities uh, to work together. So besides the, the collaboration and network projects, I think quantum I would highlight as one of the big areas of mm. importance right now. Mm. Can I highlight another? Uh, uh, which is one of my favorite uh, projects is the Smart Hospital Alliance. Mm. Denmark and Korea are both countries that are facing demographic changes. We know we have a huge burden going forward in terms of healthcare, elderly care. But we are also uh, tech savvy countries, both our people and our, our politicians and our enterprises. So we want to use AI and robotics uh, in building the smart hospitals. And it makes a lot of sense that we facilitate that the companies and the hospitals, they meet and compare notes uh, on how you're going to do this. Uh, and we are both leaders in mm. Korea and in Denmark uh, in this. And here's the interesting thing. When the Koreans travel to Denmark and the Danes travel to Korea to see how are they doing specifically with robotics in this hospital, it's a lot of an aha. Oh. And things are different. Because we, the easiest thing for us is to travel to Sweden or Germany mm. or the UK, the usual suspects and close friends, and see what they do. But they think a little bit the same way. But very often when we come to Korea and the Koreans come to Denmark, we go, Aha, oh, that's interesting. That's a different way of approaching. So there's a lot of uh, valuable uh, learning in this. But that's just one example on the smart hospital. Can you give us like, some examples what they <laughs> were surprised? Like Sven is uh, pointing to the whole, what you could call like the social acceptance. Mm. How do the people interact? And, and I think what impresses in Denmark is how naturally Koreans find it mm. to interact with robotics. And uh, uh, one of the peculiar things was uh, the robotics design here with the human face-like uh, characters. So things like that also come up in the, in, in the meetings, saying what kind of importance can a small face have on, uh, on a robotic for this innovation to actually be successful in its implementation. So those are the type of experience where it's not just a technical collaboration, it's really seeing it, how it works in practice here. It is very interesting to hear that the same technology could be accepted very differently depending on the social and cultural context. One of the innovation networks that we have supported uh, last year was actually on uh, the blue bioeconomy. And blue bioeconomy is, is basically about uh, taking some of the marine resources with uh, advanced biotech make it into really valorizing it through biorefinery and we can get uh, medicine, we can get ingredients, we can get materials. What was really interesting is that um, between Denmark and Korea, Korea ha is one of the world's largest seaweed producers. <laughs> the interesting fact is that uh, not only in Denmark, but actually the rest of Europe and most of the Western world, there's practically no seaweed production. Production of seaweeds such as kelp, sea mustard, and hijiki is mainly concentrated in Asia. According to a 2019 report by the UN Food Organization, or FAO, about 98% of the world's seaweed is produced in Asia. By country, the biggest producers are China at almost 57%, followed by Indonesia at almost 28%, and Korea at around 5%. And in recent years, not just Asia, but countries around the world are paying attention to seaweed as an optimal future food that can slow down climate change and respond to future food crises. Seaweed, sometimes called the vegetable of the sea, is rich in protein, vitamins, and minerals. It also grows quickly and has a high carbon absorption capacity. Currently, about 97% of the world's seaweed is produced through farming. Seaweed farming does not require many resources, so there are fewer concerns about pollutants generated during farming. In addition, seaweed farming is expected to regenerate the marine ecosystem and reduce greenhouse gases. On the other hand, in Denmark, we are a very big food producing nation. So the complementarity here is to say, um, how can we get seaweed into our sphere of, uh, of biosolutions of food now that we don't have a production? 
there's been a, a lot of uh, researchers talking about this, mm -hmm. but also visits to the seaweed farms. Uh, and, and the issue is also that it's not really feasible to just start a seaweed production in Europe if there's not a market. So Koreans eat seaweed, mm -hmm. Europeans don't eat seaweed. What, it, what we're seeing now is an attempt to also do the, you need to innovate on the whole product. You need to produce seaweed, but you also need to have products that the consumers will actually want to eat. And mm -hmm. if we don't have a gastronomy that uses seaweed, there's like a whole line of innovation that needs uh, to take place. On the other hand, the Korean seaweed industry uh, is also facing some, some challenges. It's not necessarily been modernized. It's not necessarily uh, catapulted into this modern bioeconomy where we really look at the high value products from the seaweed. So there's also a big interest on the Korean side in terms of how do we make this production more sustainable, uh, but also how do we make more uh, high value products uh, through some of the, the modern bio solutions that, that Denmark is extremely strong on. The number of food startups and very, very strong food sector that we have in Denmark mm. is of interest to some of the Korean stakeholders that really want to do more food innovation with the seaweed, so mm. not just the traditional uh, food products. Mm. So this is where there is a mutual interest, but very, very different uh, resources on, mm. on, uh, on both sides. But how did you first get interested in seaweed? Because, you, as you just said, you don't consume seaweed in European countries, right? No, it's not our tradition. Uh -huh. But we come at it from a little bit of a different uh, angle because uh, two things. Uh, one is we're actively looking for the, few, for the foods of the future uh -huh. because uh, we need foods that have less of a climate impact. So there's a lot, whole movement. In, in Denmark saying we, we want more, we want to go this direction, but a little bit of confusion also, but what do you do with it? Uh, how can we sort of adapt this as a raw material to our way of making food? So here we go to Korea and say, you know everything about uh, this resource from tradition uh, and, from, and we're sort of piggybacking also on the immense popularity right now across the globe, mm. also in Denmark on Korean foods. Mm. If you say to somebody, this is a Korean ingredient, people will be interested. <laughs> Um, mm. immediately. But it's research. It's not something that's immediately marketable. It's something where our researchers and food innovators have to come together and research and innovate and find long-term solutions. We're looking at something as basic as human food. Yeah. Uh, what are we going to live for off in the, in the future? It, it, it takes some time to get that formula right. Mm. So in what areas would you like to see more cooperation and exchange between the two countries in the future? Perhaps one thing that, that I hope to see also more in terms of startups, mm. that startups can access uh, the markets. Korea and Denmark are uh, 8,000 kilometers apart. Uh, we have very different uh, markets, uh, language barriers, etc. But one of the ambitions and, and hopes is really that uh, we can make it more feasible and accessible also for the smaller companies because this is really where we need to have to give them a hand to start collaborating. Uh, but it's also very important for, for the startups that they have the ambition, that they have more global and international uh, ambition. Mm. And we have seen some great examples last year. We've also, you know, compliments to Korea for really trying to build some attractive programs for international startups, such as the K Grant Challenge, where we, uh, we saw a Danish startup who entered last year. So I hope we will see more uh, examples of this because I, I think it's a very important uh, step in the journey of a company that from the beginning you can get the global uh, perspective and have the ambition to be able to collaborate mm. both across geographies but also that, that the businesses are science and knowledge based. Mm. So this is one segment that I hope you know maybe in the next 10 years it will become more clear uh, so Korea is not a Silicon Valley, but Korea is a very uh, has the ambition to become an important hub for startup and entrepreneurship in uh, in Asia. Mm. So Ambassador, what in what areas would you like to see more cooperation in the future? We would really like uh, to work even closer with Korea on those technologies, those innovative areas where we can address climate change. Mm. That's a broad field. We just talked about food. Mm. That's an important sector. Hydrogen. 
wind uh, energy, energy efficiency, these are all places where we have to find solutions. It is urgent. It is the largest challenge, most serious challenge facing humankind. Uh, I think with the innovation centers that Seoul, Korea, Copenhagen, Denmark is, we have an obligation also to work together to find the solutions. Mm. After the interview, I remember that the director expressed her wish to expand cooperation in the startup field. So I decided to briefly interview the CEO of a Korean startup who had experience cooperating with Innovation Center Denmark in Seoul. 먼저 대표님 그 회사 소개를 좀 부탁드릴게요. 어, 네 안녕하십니까 주식회사 업사이트 대표이사 임강우입니다. 어, 저희는 딥러닝을 활용해서 건축물 공정 관리 솔루션을 제공하고 있습니다. 건설 현장에서 찍어지는 사진들을 저희 딥러닝 모델로 분석하고 이를 통해서 건축물을 더 정교하게 지을 수 있는 솔루션을 제공하고 있습니다. 그 이노베이션 센터랑은 어떤 계기로 같이 협업을 하게 되셨는지 궁금합니다. 이노베이션 센터에서 글로벌 진출 프로그램들을 음. 많이 운영하고 또 스타트업들을 많이 지원해 준다라는 얘기를 듣고 같이 협업을 진행하게 됐고 이를 통해서 저희가 꽤 많은 해외 프로그램들과 덴마크의 여러 기업들, 대학들과도 많은 협업들을 진행할 수 있었습니다. 저희가 글로벌 진출을 계속 고민하고 저희 내부 인원들도 해외의 경험이 좀 많이 있는 인원들도 있는데 사실 경험이 있는 거랑 해외에 진출하는 거는 꽤 많은 갭이 있거든요. 음. 그런 부분에서 소프트 랜딩을 할수 있게 음. 이노베이션 센터에서 정말 많이 도와줬었고요. 어떻게 하면 은 저희 솔루션이 해외에 적용될 수 있는지 음. 그리고 이런 솔루션들이 해외에 들어가기 위해서 협업할 만한 기업들과 아니면 기관들에 음. 대해서 저희보다 꽤 많이 분석을 해 주셨었고 음. 또 만날 수 있는 자리들을 마련해 주셨어서 음. 꽤 빠르게 저희가 해외에 적응할 수 있었고요. 음. 지금 국내 대기업들과도 많이 협업을 하고 있는 상황인데요. 국내 사업보다는 지금 해외 사업 비중이 꽤 많이 높아진 상태고 음. 이러한 이유가 아마 저는 이노베이션 센터와의 협업 경험 덕분이 음. 아닐까라고 생각하고 있습니다. During the interview, I was able to see that various entities were acting as a bridge connecting one nation to another. I hope that Korea and Denmark will continue to cooperate in various fields through the Danish Embassy and ICDK Seoul to solve the problems facing us and working together for a better world. And on a really personal note, I really hope that we will see a lot of uh, Danish startups interested in, in seaweed and some of the... <laughs> but I, I will tell you that my daughter is currently visiting Korea. Uh, and just yesterday she said to me, I gotta have some kimbap. I, I want to go out uh, you know, and see what is here. So there is this interest mm. in Europe for, uh, for innovative foods from, uh, uh, from Korea. Mm.